Um, let me make this big again. <clears throat> okay, the thing I'm recording on here will get uploaded to YouTube. Uh, if you don't want to use the lecture capture version for some reason, the lecture capture version does do um, closed captioning transcription. It's kind of weird sometimes in terms of what it thinks I'm saying. Um, Part of that's my voice. It's kind of hard to understand understand at times. And it's also going to be partly because of <clears throat> this thing. Okay, so uh, my office is in Pick Hall 352, but that's pretty irrelevant because I'm not going to hold in-person office hours. Um, I, I know CDC and, and all these other groups say, you know, masks don't affect you. Uh, they do me. You're going to see me pause and I'm gonna to have to pull my mask off to breathe because if you've ever tried wearing one of these and talk continuously for an hour, um, you will get hypoxic. And that's why I brought this thing because I'm gonna test my pulse ox every now and then just to check because this is the first, second day I've been back in class since March of 2020, okay? Everything else has been the Zoom and online. Um, okay, so our books, which I did not pull out, are, and I've only brought one of them today, the first one. This is the first one I opened. Yeah. Three sets of books, Lloyd Alexander's Chronicles of Pernain series. The first book is the Book of Three. Second book is um, The Black Cauldron, which you might have seen the horrible Disney, Disney or dismal um, version of it and then there's three other books in that and then the other two series are by an Englishman and an Australian um, Alexander's an American Garth Nix's Abhorson trilogy which is now longer than a trilogy I think there's geez, there's at least five and I believe there's a collection of short stories also associated with that and then Jonathan Stroud's Bartimaeus trilogy um, and we'll get to those later. The last time I heard from the bookstore, which one was it? They were having trouble getting in one of these, and I believe it's the Stroud. Um, but it's always in print, so they shouldn't have a problem with that. Okay? Disclaimer, I'm not going to read through all of this because it is posted and, and you can read it. Um, the two most important things about the syllabus are this, or excuse me, about this disclaimer. The syllabus is subject to revision we might get behind and push things back a little bit and do this every day before class. If I have to cancel for some reason, um, this is eight o'clock, I'll post it to D2L, D2L by six o'clock in the morning because I know some of you have a, have a um, long drive, okay? Students with disabilities, you know who you are. I've probably already gotten that information from uh, the DAC, attendance and such. Man, that is so small on my computer. Um, read through that. You can look at the policies that are there and such. It keeps coming down. Um, what's the real import of it? What does it mean practically? I can't require you to attend class, so Honestly, you don't have to come to class. I mean, that, that's really what it means. You'll never hear anybody in the administration say that, but that's what it practically means. Um, everything that is done in class, as I said, is recorded by two different means. The, the class, the lecture capture, which is recorded up there, automatically gets uploaded to the videos tab of the D2L shell for this course. I, I literally do nothing. All I have to do is put this thing on. And even if I don't put this thing on, if I have to cancel class for some, for some reason one day, at eight o'clock, that camera comes on and records an empty classroom for 85 minutes <laughs> and no sound and uploads it to D2L, okay? It's utterly ridiculous how that kind of works. Um, but everything in class is recorded and it's located in two different locations. I will send you, I don't think I did already, um, 
I will post later on today the link to the YouTube playlist for this class. So if you're not here, you can watch the lectures, okay? But do notice, um, having said all that, I'm not going to do Zoom, so don't even scratch that out. Having said all that, if you decide not to come to class any day, every day, you're still responsible for everything that's discussed in class because you do have the lectures, all right? Um, and it's in class and on D2L that quizzes will be announced. Quizzes will not be done in class. I know some people are using D2L to do quizzes in class. To me, that kind of defeats the purpose of having them on D2L because if, if we did that in class, that would take up at least 10 minutes. So I'm just putting everything on D2L, quizzes and exams. Um, and I say somewhere later in here, for quizzes, you have, you'll get somewhere between 10 to 20 minutes for each, for each quiz. For the exams, you'll get, I think usually what I've done for this course is a minimum of 90 minutes. And you won't have 90 questions or anything like that. Okay. Um, stuff there about how many people are vaccinated and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so if you're not vaccinated, might, you might consider getting vaccinated. Um, I'm not vaccine police, nor am I mask police, okay? Uh, we've been instructed, for, I'll just tell you right now, <clears throat> that if a student comes to class without a mask on, I am supposed to walk you outside and kindly and gently talk to you about the mask policy and tell you where you can get one right next door. The secretary next door has a box of masks down below. And if you refuse to wear a mask or if you come to class the next day and you don't have a mask on, <clears throat> I'm supposed to call MTSU police. Okay, I am not going to call MTSU police. I'll, I'll just tell you that right now. I might, if it gets to the point, you know, second time you do it, I might send an email off to, and I don't remember who it is, somebody in student affairs and say, so-and-so won't wear a mask and I'm not going to call the police. I'll let them call the police if they want to do it. To me, that's utterly ridiculous. Um, but wear a mask. If you don't want to wear a mask, don't come to class. And go back to what I said previously. Everything's online. Okay. Um, Cell phones, laptops, tablets. Don't make calls in class. <laughs> Should go without saying. Don't make calls in class. Don't text in class. Don't use class as your personal selfie studio. Um, you think I'm kidding, but I'm not. I had a student a couple years ago in one of my classes sitting like in the back corner who literally spent the first 15 minutes of every day, like the first two weeks, just sitting there taking selfies. And I finally, you know, was like, I don't remember what her name was, and said, just stop, leave. She eventually did. It took her about three quarters of the semester before she finally left. Um, don't do that, okay? Little caveat about the cell phone stuff. Two things, really. One, if you're a first responder of some kind, okay, and you're on call or something like that, put it on vibrate, leave it out, okay? Um, the other thing is, and this is the really important part, right here, if you've got some kind of ongoing family emergency situation, whatever, okay, let me know, leave your phone on vibrate, leave it out, and if you've let me know, and your phone vibrates and you look at it and you get up and leave, no questions asked, all right? <laughs> I hope this won't be the case this semester in this class, but I've had, the last time I was in person, um, which was fall of 2019, from fall of 2019, probably back five years, every semester, I've had at least one student in a class um, have some kind of family emergency arise. 
parent had a heart attack, somebody hit by a car, somebody got cancer, something horrendous, okay? Um, should that happen, somebody gets COVID, you know, uh, should that happen? First, obviously, immediately take care of what needs to be taken care of. If you've got to drive somebody to the hospital, by all means, you know, do that. But within 24 hours, 48 hours at the most, just shoot me an email. You don't have to go into all the details. If you just say, you know, family medical emergency, I'm not going to be in class. I'll say, don't worry about it. Everything's online. If there's anything you need me to do, pray for you. I'll do it. Okay. If you let me know within 24, 48 hours, I'll do everything I can to make sure you can successfully finish the class. Okay, successfully doesn't mean you're going to automatically pass the class. It means I'll do everything I can. I'll adjust quiz times for you, or I'll reopen a quiz, or reopen an exam, as long as I know ahead of time. Okay, if something happens next week and you don't let me know until Halloween, you're screwed. It's just how it is, okay? Or you don't let me know as one student did until the final week of classes. Oh, I haven't, this is again, when I had an on-campus you know, attendance policy. You know, I had a family emergency and that's why I haven't been there since the end of September. I literally had a student do that. Missed all of October and November. I was like, man, I'm really sorry to hear that about your father, but I, I can't help you at this point, okay? So, something arises like that, you know, just at your earliest convenience, within 24, 48 hours, send me an email, okay? Um, you can use this or your laptop or your you know, tablet, et cetera, for your books if you got them electronically. And I think almost all of them are available electronically. But if you're sitting there and you're doing this, I know you're not reading a book, okay? Or following along or, or whatever. Um, Okay, enough of that. <clears throat> Already out of breath. Classroom decorum, I'm not going to spend much time on. Is that as small as it looks to me? Or is it a little small? Let's see here. It's a little better. That's even better. Um, try to arrive to class on time. Uh, Most of that's pretty common sense, you know, courtesy and such. This is important. Don't fall asleep in class, especially if you sit in the front row. It's a little harder for you in the back in the corner, but I will come up and do that if your head is on the desk, okay? It usually only happens once and either that person never falls asleep again or that person never comes to class again. And again, think of the non-attendance policy. If it's really hard for you to get up for an 8 o'clock class, don't get up for this 8 o'clock class. Watch it later. Do everything online if you want. Okay. I'm probably not supposed to say that according to you know, the folks in COPE and such. Um, what else? You can eat in here. Okay. All I ask is for the benefit of those sitting around you, don't come in with an extra large, extra crunchy bag of Doritos or something because the people around you start to twitch from all the noise. Um, don't come in with your you know, intro to biology textbook and have it sit open in front of you on it, as I literally had a student do in a class, on a stand, like a book stand that would hold the book open like this so I could read the cover of the textbook as she sat there and took notes from her biology textbook in class. Just don't do that, because I'll tell you to leave. Um, the last part of this, I'm not gonna talk about this. Where is it? Headphones, earbuds. If you're walking in class with them on and you take them off, totally fine. If you walk in class and sit in class and you have them on the whole time, I'm gonna call you out, because I had I usually, example of, usually use the example of one student, but I've had several who have come into class, usually sat in one of those back corners where I could hear the music up here, clearly. 
throughout the class. Okay? Um, just don't. <clears throat> First of all, if I can hear it up here, your hearing's probably shot. Um, which, you know, I'd say, take off, and he couldn't hear me with beans. Okay? I'm trying to think I had a talk. You're not going to get docked five points. I had to throw this in because I had a night class, this class, in fact, that I was offering a night a couple of years ago. About the same number of students, and literally, for the first two weeks, maybe you five or six came in with a book or something to write on. And the rest of you just came in with your wonderful selves and nothing else. And I'm like, what are you here for? Oh, because we've got to take the... How are you taking this class if you're not taking notes, if you're not following along, you know, what I'm pointing out in the books, et cetera. So bring the, bring the book that we're discussing, even if it's on, you know, computer or whatever, and bring something to take notes with. Even if you're not really taking notes, you're just doodling, you know, um, scratch my ego or whatever, okay? So what else? Failure to submit or complete three or more quizzes. I usually go through a bottle of water per class, but I'm not drinking enough with the mask on. Um, or failure to submit any exam will result in failure of the course. That's new because of my modified attendance policy. That's how I know you're doing the work, okay? Um, and it's especially gonna be important for the next two weeks. We, we will have at least two quizzes. One probably this week and, and one next, yeah, one maybe this week. And one or two possibly next week. Why? Because MTSU has to report enrollment numbers to the federal government. Why? Because an awful lot of you have federally insured student loans. And that's how the federal government makes sure it's getting its money's worth out of you. Okay. So that if I report so-and-so has not, you know, attended, and I'll know that by quizzes, I might pass around an attendance sheet in class. You know. um, you'll get contacted by the folks in financial aid. And you might lose your Hope Scholarship if you have that. You can lose your federal funding, et cetera. Hand up. It'll be spread out. That is, I'll post the quiz and you'll have anywhere from three days to maybe five days to complete it, okay? The quiz itself, you'll have 10 to 15 minutes, but it'll be open for probably three to five days, okay? Usually what I've done past couple of years <clears throat> is I'll post it like on a Wednesday and it'll be due either Saturday or Sunday at midnight. And I really encourage you, don't wait until 11.50 before it's due. Because inevitably, that's when, you know, the, God, the computer demons will decide to come out of their shells and whatever, you know, we'll have thunderstorms or tornadoes or you live in Waverly and, you know, everything's swept away. You know. Last couple of years have just been crazy. Um, but if you don't do three of them, you've automatically failed the course, all right? I just, I've added that this semester. <clears throat> um, grading, no makeup quizzes will be given, okay? And I will send out probably, maybe I'll do it today or tomorrow over what I talked about today. Not the syllabus, but the Tolkien stuff. Yeah, it's a good idea. Um, I'll send out a sample quiz to show you what the quizzes kind of look like. Some quizzes will be true, false. Some will be multiple choice. Most will probably be answer question, fill in the blank kind of short, pretty short answer. Usually one or two, every now and then, you know, maybe a sentence at, at most, all right? Um, you can do those on your phones. You can do them on whatever technology you want to use. 
right? And again, if we have some weird weather thing happen, I'll extend the deadlines and stuff because, you know, seems inevitable. I'll post the quiz and we get a line of serious storms come through for two or three days. You know, um, when was it? Last spring? Last fall? Spring of 2020? I can't remember when there was a tornado in East Nashville. Spring of 2020. Tornado in East Nashville. And it was like all of my students were from East Nashville, you know, in one of my classes. Okay. Um, if you're in the position of one of those ongoing or, you know, family emergencies, let me know. I have extended or reopened quizzes for students before because of that. Okay. Same thing with the exams. Notice, unlike most of these 2020 courses, I'm not requiring you to write a paper for the simple reason that I don't look at this as a writing course. It's a literature course, okay? So we're gonna focus on getting into the nuts and bolts of what it is we're reading, and we're not gonna focus on how well you can write your ideas down about that. Because the way I look at this kind of course is, I wanna try and get a lot of this material stuck in your head. And then you'll deal with it later on. Because it'll sit in your brain, just kind of percolating. And things will happen in your life a year from now, two years from now, five years from now. And something in something that we've read will click. And you'll go, damn, we read about this, just kind of this kind of situation. Or how would, you know, so-and-so deal with this? One of the other fantasy lit courses I teach, um, I've got it after this course, is a course on J.R.R. Tolkien and J.K. Rowling. So we read The Lord of the Rings and all the Harry Potter novels, okay? Well, there's an awful lot between those two sets of books to, you know, talk about quote unquote life lessons. Okay, so the assignment reading schedule. Any questions so far other than the one or two we've had? Um, pretty simple. So the first, what is that, about three weeks it looks like? Three and a half weeks are devoted to Lloyd Alexander's Chronicles of Predain series. And notice, I've got it kind of divided up to about a book um, every day and a half. It might get adjusted down a little bit. That's because these might seem long, to some of you, if you're not a regular reader, where are the page numbers there? That's the end of the book, that's why. You know, but this, you know, that's about the author, that's the glossary. This book is 186 pages, okay? Not that long. Again, unless you've never read a novel before, in which case it might seem ex extremely long. But if you also look at it, there's a lot of white space on each page. That is, there's, there's a lot of room between the lines, et cetera. If you were to compare this with, I gotta get another cord for my computer. Well, <laughs> if you were to compare this with this, there's a big difference. But look at the difference between that, the number of words per page, and that, the number of words per page, okay? This is a lot easier. Lot, let me rephrase that. This is a much faster read than is this, okay? Um, and pretty much all of the books in the Chronicles of Pridane are like that. They're, they're all right around 180 to maybe 220 pages. I think the... <coughs> Which one is it? Either the fourth or fifth book is the longest, but it's not much more, maybe 40 or 50 pages longer. But then you're going to have a huge shock when you go from these books to uh, Jonathan Stroud's Bartimaeus books. 
because the first Bartimaeus book is almost like this. It's 400 some pages and they don't get any shorter, okay? And then we'll get to the Garth Nix books and they're a little bit shorter, okay? So if you're not a big reader, start. Start now, okay? Try to get ahead. Um, I've had students before, you know, I'm not a big reader. I'm a slow reader. What can I do? A couple things. Um, obviously, one, read the stuff. Two, if you can afford it, download them on Audible or other. They might be on Apple Music. They might be on, on, um, on other things. Okay. And if you have a drive every day, and I don't mean like 10 minutes, but if you have a 35, 45 hour long drive every day, listen to it in your car. Listen to it when you're doing stuff that doesn't require a lot of brain work. Okay. Um, that's one great way to do it. If you want, I've had, you know, students tell me they've done this. Um, the stuff I put up on YouTube, you can convert pretty easily to an MP3, okay? And you can listen to that because what I try to do is I try to pull out what I think are the most important things from, you know, each book, okay? So that's the, notice I don't have the quizzes posted on here. Why? Because I don't know exactly when I'm going to create and upload them, things like that. But you can assume once we finish Lloyd Alexander, around September 21st. It might be more like the 23rd or 24th, we'll, we'll see. Um, during that same week is when I'll post the exam and you'll have, like I said, probably about five days in which you can complete that exam. Then we'll start Stroud and when we get down to the end of Stroud, somewhere around there, that's when you'll have um, to complete that exam, okay? So that's where I talk about <clears throat> at the bottom. Minimum of one quiz per book. So that's five and six. That's 11 quizzes minimum, okay? Um, at the very least, I'll probably drop the lowest quiz, okay? Um, might, be, might be more, but usually at least one. And I'm pretty sure what I've done in the past is when I get to both Stroud and Nix, um, pretty sure there's about two quizzes for each of those books because they are so much longer, all right? Don't think there's anything else. So quizzes, I say in here, 10 to 15 minutes um, to complete each of, those, each of those exams, 60 to 90 minutes. Okay. Now, one other thing, so that, that's the syllabus. Any questions about syllabus? All I do for grading, grade your quizzes, they'll get posted to you, but not in grades. I don't use the grading thing on D2L because it involves a, a lot more work on my part. Um, but when you complete it, it'll be, or once I go through, because I'll go through each quiz. I don't, D2L is like a lot of artificial intelligence in that it's really stupid, okay? If you don't word something exactly the way I word it, it'll be marked wrong. If you don't put an apostrophe in, it'll be marked wrong, okay? If you spell Stroud, S-T-R-A-W-D, it'll be marked wrong, okay? Um, I'll accept that. Don't do it, but I'll, I'll accept it, all right? Um, if it's clear to me, you know what the, what the answer is supposed to be, you get the credit for it, okay? So I go through each one, each, each quiz and grade them. Once that's done, you can go back and look at it. You can see the right, right answers, wrong answers, et cetera, et cetera, all right? Exams will be largely based upon the quizzes. I think I say in there something like, you know, 75% or so. So there'll be enough quizzes on Lloyd Alexander so that when we have the exam, you know, I'll 
Some of them I'll directly copy and paste questions. Usually I'll copy and paste and then just tweak them slightly so it's not exactly the same, but you know, really close. Um, okay. I've also put on, that's not it. I've also put on D2L the link to Tolkien's essay on fairy stories, okay, which is what, again, I'm going to talk about now. I'm not going to leave this up because I want to talk about what I've written on the board. But should you want to read it, you're not required to. Okay? But it's a, it's a really good kind of essay for understanding at least how Tolkien thinks fantasy works, okay? And that's really what he means by fairy stories, fantasy type literature, all right? So I'm going to close this. I'm going to keep recording so that I can use the board. So I've got to... Lighting, go on, close, display, off. What's with the lighting? And now they won't come on up front. Go figure. So, Jer does everybody know who J.R.R. Tolkien is? Anybody not know? I mean, don't be ashamed if you don't know. He wrote The Lord of the Rings. He wrote The Hobbit. He wrote The Hobbit in 1937. Um, started off as a story he, he read to his children. Actually started off one day. He was a professor at Oxford University of Anglo-Saxon Literature. And one day, one summer, summer of 1930, 1931, he was grading entrance exams. Blue book, okay? So he had a blue book, <clears throat> sorry. He had a blue book, he finished, you know, writing, I, I held this thing in my hand. He finished the student's essay, had a pencil in his hand, and he turned over a page, <clears throat> blank page, and he just wrote, in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. He had no freaking idea what a hobbit was. He'd never heard the word before. Literally, he'd never seen the word before. And he just writes, in a hole on the ground there lived a hobbit. So he had to figure out, well, what the hell's a hobbit? So he starts writing a story. Now, he had been writing stories about Middle Earth long before then, writing poetry, creating dictionaries of made-up languages. I mean, he's a real nerd, okay? Um, so he starts writing the story. He reads it to friends, reads it to his children. They suggest getting it published. It gets published. It's an international bestseller immediately. Okay, so he starts writing, you know, other things. Well, in 1938, he's invited to do a lecture at St. Andrews University for the Andrew Lang, it's called the Andrew Lang Lecture. Andrew Lang was a famous collector of folk tales and fairy tales in the United Kingdom, right? And so they invite Tolkien to come deliver this lecture because of the publication of The Hobbit. He wasn't their first choice. He was their third choice, and he agreed to do it. So he gets up and he delivers this lecture. I used to, um, many, many years ago, I was working on an edition of this lecture, and I had transcribed all the manuscript copies and all that, all of the little notes and everything, and the estate granted permission to publish to somebody else. Oh, I was working on that. I was, yeah, really pissed at the time. Anyways. So I've held all these things in my hand. So Tolkien, you know, does this essay. What time is it? 8.37, we get out of here at 9.40. Um, no, we get out of here at 9.25. So he stands up in front of the group of students and, and academics, 
And he tells them, you know, you've invited me here to talk about fairy stories, but, you know, doing so is kind of dangerous. And, you know, it's only for the overbold to kind of take this on. Well, his name, Tolkien, T-O-L-K-I-E-N, means overbold. So he's punning on his name there. Anyways, he goes on and says, so I guess I ought to say something since you paid me to come deliver this lecture. And what he says is, I'm going to talk about three things. These three questions I should at least address. What are fairy stories, fantasy literature? What are their origins? When and where and how did they begin? And what is their use function now? Okay. So he proceeds to address these three questions. And for the first two questions, he spends several pages to essentially say, what are fairy stories? I don't know, but I know them when I see them. Or, be a little more accurate, he says they cannot be defined. Because think of what that word define means. D, out of, away from, fine, like finite, okay? Well, if something is infinite, then what does it not have? Limits. So when you define something, you put a limit around it, right? Okay? So he says they can't be defined. You can't put kind of an arbitrary limit around fairy stories. Because as soon as you do, someone will mention a story and you'll go, oh, you're right. That is a fairy story. It doesn't fit the definition, okay? So he says, but I can tell you that I know them when I see them. It's, it's like when, I always forget the name of the Supreme Court Justice. My son who just finished law school would tell me, you know, like that. I think it's Potter Stewart, um, who a, a, an obscenity case came before the Supreme Court, pornography or something like that. And he said, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. That is something that's obscene or pornographic. That's pornographic, but I can't define pornography or obscenity kind of a thing. Okay? So Tolkien said, we, we can't limit them. We can say some of the qualities that they have, but we can't say what qualities they necessarily don't have, okay? And he gives all kinds of examples of fairy stories. So, scratch that one off. What are their origins? <clears throat> when did humans start to talk? Because he essentially says, what, what are their origins? Their origins are in language. When did that begin? And he talks about theorists, Germanic philologists, who said, you know, I shouldn't say you know, because you don't. Um, things like mythology are, they didn't use this language, but, you know, with COVID in the air, <laughs> literally, I'm going to use this exact. Mythology is like a virus of the mind. It's, it's not a good thing, in other words. And Tolkien said, what? No, just the opposite. Mythology, myths, legends, stories. They're what language is all about. They're what language is for. See, the reason Tolkien created all of his Middle Earth stories, The Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, the stuff that gets published after his death as the Silmarillion, the stuff that gets published after that as the 12 volumes of the history of Middle Earth, which I have, <laughs> nerd. Um, it's because languages aren't real, Tolkien asserted, unless, what? Anybody know? Why is Klingon not a real language? And I know if you're a Star Trek you know, fan, you probably want to kill me, because I've known people who are like that, because there aren't stories written in Klingon. Now, take that back. Somebody will get on the internet, and I'm sure there are now. Um, 
A language has to have a culture that speaks it and that stories in it, that makes stories in it. So when Tolkien, you know, was writing his dictionaries of gnomish and elvish, etc., in the 1920s, and even while he was in the trenches in World War I in France, you know, his, his mates, you know, look, in fact, this guy is screwy in the head because he's sitting there while shells are being lobbed and he's writing the derivations of gnomish verbs, you know. Yeah, if you're about to die, what the hell, you know. Um, but he realized this means absolutely nothing unless it's preserved in some kind of story form. For example, you can read, you know, old, old Akkadian cuneiform texts and almost all of them that survive. Anybody know what they preserve? I don't think I have any in my wallet. Yes, I do. Things like receipts, bills of sale, economic transactions, okay? Now, there are some that survive. Good place, by the way. <laughs> there are some that survive in literary texts, the most famous of which, the Epic of Gilgamesh, okay? Which is myth and legend, okay? So, Tolkien said, what are their origins? Who knows? Who first came up with the idea, for example, of something that would confer invisibility? Name anything off the top of your head in popular culture that can make you invisible today. I don't mean really. <laughs> Mythically, fantastically. Louder? Invisibility cloak. How many of you have read Harry Potter? A few. Some of you don't want to say. How many of you have seen the Harry Potter films? Yeah, almost all of you. Okay? Cloak of Invisibility. Not original to J.K. Rowling. A ring. I don't wear my wedding ring anymore because my fingers are too fat. A ring that confers invisibility. J.R. Tolkien. Not original to Tolkien. It comes from the Nibelungen lead. The Lay of the Nibelungs, which has a magic ring that makes you invisible. Not original to the author of the Nibelungen lead. The idea of something that can make you invisible goes back to who the hell knows? We, we don't know. Okay? It, it's apparently something that we, humanity, think is necessary because it keeps showing up in our myths and folk tales, all right? <clears throat> so you got to scratch that. And, and in, in talking about the origins, he also talks about how stories come to be. For example, some people think, a lot of people think, <clears throat> That the way to the way to understand the Lord of the Rings, Book of Three, etc., best is to figure out what went into them. That is, how did Tolkien come up with this idea, or how did Lloyd Alexander come up with this idea? Well, he kind of tells you at the beginning. He says eh, it's kind of loosely based on Welsh myth. This is also, in, in some sense, loosely based on Welsh myth. It says Welsh myth, English myth, Germanic myth, Latin myth, Hebrew myth. You know, the third volume of this is called The Return of the King. What does the return of the king have to do with Hebrew myth? Well, if you're Christian, Jesus, who is the once and future king, to use T.H. White's formulation of it, if you're Jewish, the Messiah, okay, 
So Tolkien, in talking about this personally, he says, how do stories come to be? Think of a big old cauldron sitting right here. I could pull up a picture of one. Laycock Abbey in, in um, Chippenham, England, when I used to, I haven't done it for several years, when I used to teach my Harry Potter course in, in London, we'd go to Laycock Abbey because it was one of the sites used for the films, okay? And there's this big old cauldron in there and it's used as Snape's cauldron in Snape's dungeon. And every time I take students there, you know, we'd always have to make sure that none of the docents, that is the people who worked at the Abbey were, were around at the National Trust because they'd all want to climb in the cauldron and get their pictures taken. Because this thing's, you know, five, six hundred years old, okay? Well, Tolkien says, think of a cauldron. I'm trying to say this shot, Siri. Uh, think of a cauldron that elements get poured into. Just ideas and images. And he calls it the soup of story or the cauldron of story. So think of it another way. How many of you have had a real good hearty soup before? Liquid, neat vegetables, etc., or you know, maybe a stew, same kind of thing. Well, let's say one day I tell you, don't worry about having breakfast or anything, or even lunch that day, because I'm gonna bring in a really thick, you know, belly-filling stew for you. And you're all cool. Go, you know, eight o'clock in the morning, maybe not. And you come in. And I have these four desks reserved. And you walk in, and there's a pot of water here, and there's peppers, onions, carrots, celery, salt, pepper, a bunch of other spices, and a whole bunch of chopped up meat right here. And right here I have a table with all kinds of you know bowls and silverware attached. And I say, Dig in. What are you going to do? What are you going to think? And you're shaking your head. That ain't soup, right? What is it? It's the ingredients of it. It's not the same thing. All those things that go into the cauldron of story are not the same as what comes out. So you can read The Lord of the Rings and you can try to pick out all the little elements that go into it, the Old Norse, the Finnish, the Welsh, the German, the Gothic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's not going to give you this. Okay? Gandalf makes a statement in here, talking to Sarah Mann. Sarah Mann says, I am now Sarah Mann of many colors. And he has already thinks he's, you know, Joseph in the amazing technicolor coat. He, uh, he has this cloak that's supposed to be white. And he says, I am now a sure man of many colors. And Gandalf looks and notices it kind of shimmers. And Gandalf says, I like white better. Nice little put down. And Sarah man says, white. The white light can be broken. The white page can be overwritten. It actually says the white page can be overwritten first. And he finishes with, the white light can be broken, right? Bring in a prism and a flashlight. Shine the flashlight through the prism, and what do you get? Roy G. Bibb. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. I do remember some high school science. And that's when he said, he says, you know, the white light can be broken. And Gandalf responds, in which case it is no longer white. Right? And then he says, and he who would break a thing to see what it is has left the path of wisdom. Think about that for a moment. He who would break a thing to see what it is has left the path of wisdom. Why? You break the thing, this. What are you left with? The ingredients. It's no longer the thing itself. Have any of you seen Amazon's The Expanse? If you haven't, my wife and I are going through it the second time. I started reading the novels it's based on. It's really, really cool. And it's, it's fantasy. It's 
I know it's billed as sci-fi, it's fantasy, okay? Well, there's this thing in there where this, this guy takes apart a human being, another person. Why? I'm trying to figure out what it is. So he you know, ripped the arm off, ripped the arm off, ripped the fingers off, pulled the scalp, pulled the skull off. Gotta figure out what it is. Well, what have you just done? You've really left the path of wisdom because the person who was disassembled had been breathing just about 10 minutes before. And you can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Okay? So, forget all that. So what is their use or function now? Fairy stories. Give me an example of a fairy story other than, you know, one of these. Any. Okay. Series. Okay. Give me a more traditional one. Shrek. Shrek. <laughs> kind of a parodic, you know, version. Okay. Even a more traditional. Come on, you guys. The Snow Queen. Louder. The Snow Queen. Snow Queen. Narnia. Little Red Riding Hood. Hansel and Gretel. Are you guys familiar with these? Have you ever been told? Please tell me you are familiar. Otherwise, I'm just gonna. <laughs> <laughs> I never know it any, anymore, you know. Um, Hansel and Gretel and such, you know. Little Red Riding Hood, Snow White, Sleeping Beauty. Think of all the Disney bastardizations of various, you know, things, okay? Why do we still have fairy stories today? And what's their use function now? Now, notice he makes it sound like you use this for something. No, I don't. <laughs> what the hell? Um, I'm not like a lot of my colleagues, not necessarily here, around the U.S. that says or that believe you do still want to be a little careful. That this is merely one form of ideology. That is, that Lloyd Alexander merely wants to propagandize you into believing something. He might be. I have no idea. He's dead now. Okay, You can't answer that question. Tolkien says, in the beginning of the second edition of his works, when he wrote it, he had, you know, in his mind, it had no inner meaning or intention. A lot of people think, oh, Tolkien was this conservative Catholic. He's trying to, you know, foist off his... He says no. Okay? A lot of English professors say all, all, every bit of literature you read is political. I don't agree with them. I think sometimes it's just, you know, as Tolkien says in that forward, the writer just wants to amuse, delight, excite you, maybe instill some fear, maybe instill and maybe this is getting to the political a little bit. Maybe instill a little bit of humility. Maybe kind of, as Shakespeare says, hold a mirror up and say, do you see yourself anywhere in here? And by the way, that's not original to Shakespeare. That goes back to Soc um, Aristotle says that about ancient Greek tragedy and such. So. Tolkien says, what's their use function now? And in that section, he talks about children to some extent. Why would he talk about children? Probably many of you. What the heck just happened? Damn things. Many of you, if you came in and you saw this, you thought fairy stories? Come on. I'm in college. What are we talking about fairy stories? Well, you probably did that if you did that because you thought fairy stories, those are for children. Tolkien says it's only an accident of history that children began reading fairy stories in the 19th century and that they became relegated to children kind of in the 20th century. We have a whole kind of concentration in the English department called children's literature. 
And that's where most of the fairy stories are taught. Okay? But Tolkien goes on and says, I don't think I closed it on here. <clears throat> I don't think I have it pulled up. Tolkien goes on <clears throat> and says in here that fairy stories are ultimately <clears throat> for adults. I'm going to see if I can find it real quickly. I probably can't. Why? Why? Why us? Do any of you know a young kid, I don't know, three years to ten years old? Let me rephrase that. A young kid who hasn't been so battered by reality that the kid is still a kid. The kid still sees through the eyes of a child. So that if you go for a walk with that kid and the kid sees, you know, a cool rock on the ground, picks up, look at this, really, and you're like, it's a rock, put it down, you know, a dog peed on that. Right? <laughs> In other words, the difference between seeing through the eyes of wonder and seeing through the jaded 60-year-old, you know, life sucks and then you die eyes kind of thing, okay? Well, Tolkien says children don't need to kind of believe. It comes naturally to them, all right? That's why you can pull a fast one on a kid really, really easily. <laughs> I'll go ahead and say it. And in one sense, an awful lot of people like me, meaning PhDs, are the stupidest people in the world. Because you can pull fast ones on them too. A lot of us are really gullible. Why? Because if something is said by somebody else with a PhD, seemingly, it's automatically true. Meaning you know. So, Tolkien says, they should be written for and used by adults. Why? Because fairy stories can offer us, adults, these four things, all of which children don't need. Most children, okay? And he talks about each, all four of these. First one, fantasy. So what does he mean by fantasy? What, is, what does the word fantasy mean? Don't go off on sex and all that weird stuff. Just Imagination. How many of you wish you had a better imagination? <clears throat> My imagination was killed in the 70s by being glued to the boob tube. The TV. It, it just you know, wiped the slate clean, seemingly. All right? Who had a good imagination? Tolkien did. How, how in the world did he sit there the hot summer day, turned the page, in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit when he never heard the word hobbit before. J.K. Rowling, okay? Single mother, living on welfare, taking a train from Manchester, England to London, England, and one day, as she's doing this, you know, at that moment in time, she is, as I said, single, unwed mother, living on welfare, pretty much penniless, She dabbled in writing before, and an idea pops into her mind of a boy who discovers on his 11th birthday that his parents were murdered by the most horrendous dark wizard that had ever lived, and he's after him too. Why did that idea pop in her head and not mine? <laughs> Why didn't I write in a hole in the ground that lived the Hobbit? Because think about it. She goes almost literally from being penniless to within 10 years of the publication, not the beginning of the writing, not the idea, when it first pops in her mind. From the beginning, from the first publication of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone in England, 1997, within 10 years from that, she's the wealthiest woman in the United Kingdom. That includes the queen. 
She's wealthier than the house of Windsor. Why? Because an idea popped into her mind on a train. Okay? She obviously still had a good imagination. So, Tolkien says, fantasy, arresting strangeness. In a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. If any of you read The Hobbit, probably the first time you read it, you're like, well, what does that mean? If you weren't familiar with all the other stuff. First time I read The Hobbit, tried to read it first, I think when I was 15. I got maybe 30, 40 pages in. It didn't do anything. Try to read it again. I think I got about 50 or 60 pages. It didn't do anything. Tried it again about six months, and I read it through. And then I read The Lord of the Rings in about three days. This. And then I read it again, like within a month. And I've read it probably 50 times since then. Okay? I haven't read The Hobbit nearly as much. Um, so, arresting strangeness. Things out of the ordinary. If you were alive in 1977, you could go see a movie whose very beginning redefined kind of, at that moment, movie openings. Anybody know which movie I'm talking about? Star Wars. Star Wars. Because how did it begin? Words. <laughs> Going, how do you describe it? Up, down, down, out, into space. Nobody had ever begun a movie that way. And then, once the words left, what happened? You had this big old star destroyer come in from the upper right and travel down this way. And it wasn't all spiffy clean. It wasn't like Stanley Kubrick's um, 2001 A Space Odyssey, where everything looked like it had just come off the assembly line. This thing had blast points, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? So it kind of jostles you out of your comfort level. Well, in you know, all the ground there lived a hobbit. Yeah, it kind of did too, right? So fantasy, it takes you outside your everyday existence. Which kind of leads to this part, escape. Because this is the number one charge made against all fantasy literature. It is escapist. So, what does that imply? How many of you wish, and you can, I mean, feel free to. How many of you wish you could escape right now, just Maybe not. How many of you wish you could escape the thing hanging over all of our heads that has been hanging over all of our heads for a year and a half, two years, according to what some scientists say? Yeah, I'd like to be able to go back to about, oh, I don't know, August 2019 and get a do-over for the time after. My daughter's an ICU nurse. She finished, you, you might, she's been on CNN and CBS and thing, MSNBC, I think MSNBC, um, quite a bit, ICU nurse here in town. She's seen an awful lot of death. She was hired just about when COVID began in an ICU hospital in Nashville. For a new nurse to be introduced, you know, to death <laughs> immediately, just one after the other, okay? You know, it's kind of numbing and such. Would she like to escape? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay? So Tolkien says it offers us escape. Escape from what? Escape from reality? Okay. Be a little more specific. And he goes in and he talks about the kinds of things we'd like to escape from. You know, we mentioned before what, you know, what kind of thing can confer invisibility? An invisibility cloak. A ring. Why is that important? Why do we want to be invisible? Why do seemingly humans have a need for invisibility? Or how many of you ever dreamt of flying? on your own. No, no ship, no plane, 
just, you know, cruising like an eagle. Probably everybody in here has. That kind of implies it's part of our collective unconscious. And it is something that springs deep from inside us. Why? How many of you have a pet? A couple dogs, cat, two cats, etc. How many of you wish you could speak to your pet and have that pet speak back? I wouldn't because my cats would drive me crazy. Because <laughs> they'd say, you call me wretch all the time. Well, you're a... <laughs> but, you know, one of the dogs? Oh, yeah. I'd love to sit down and have a talk. Right? Okay, that's a pet, though. You know, pets are sentient beings, right? How about a tree? Tolkien was a huge tree lover. I mean, he puts modern day, you know, echo warriors to shame <laughs> in terms of, you know, his love of trees and such. I'm from California. Used to go backpacking in the sequoias and such. Okay? I don't know if you've ever seen a really big tree. You don't have any in Tennessee. I mean, a tree that you go and you stand at the base of. I've seen a tree that in diameter goes from that wall to about right here. Okay? That is about 200 feet tall. That tree's seen a lot. I really love to talk to that tree. Well, tree beard. That's the character, all right? Why? Because Tolkien says, we apparently have a need deep down inside to commune with things not like ourselves. Thus, the search for alien life. Why? Because what if we really are all that there is in the vast expanse of the universe? Then that means what? We're all alone. I'm not talking religion, God, whatever. I'm talking, you know, physical breathing, you know, whatever things. That's, in one sense, that's a pretty sobering thought, right? And kind of, it can make you feel really, really important, or it can make you feel so insignificant. The existentialists of the 1930s, 40s, 50s thought, it makes us what? Zip, nada, zilch, nothing. We are nothing but a pimple on the butt of the universe. That's it. Sorry for that image, but you know. <laughs> It shows how insignificant we really are, according to the existentialists of the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Okay? What other kinds of things do we want to escape from? Like our own physical limitations. I can't run like Usain Bolt. I can't, you know, I used to run marathons. I can't anymore because I have horrible knees. Even when I was at my best, I couldn't run like some people could. Not fair. Why? Because this is what I have. Doesn't mean it's not fair. Life's not fair. Suck it up. <laughs> okay? But what else? Personal problems? Family issues? Societal issues? Yeah. How many wish you could do things that you can't do? Yeah. What's probably the biggest thing? That humanity fears and would like to escape from. We have a character named after it in a series of books. Death. Lord Voldemort, or Voldemort, depending upon your pronunciation. If you want to pronounce it in kind of crass English, Voldemort. If you want to pronounce it Frenchy, Voldemort. What does it mean? Fly to fly or flee from death doesn't want to die. He's a, not, it's not, nobody wants to die. <laughs> it's he's afraid to die. So he does everything he can to try to escape death. But what is one of the two constants in life? Death and taxes. Death and taxes, okay? 
So talking, you know, he gets finally to that point. We want to escape death. So how is escapism used badly? Because I don't think, you know, most people would say, that there's nothing bad in that, okay? So how is it used wrongly? Well, people ascribe to fantasy literature, oh, it's not facing up to reality. It's not seeing the world as it is. Well, Tolkien says, that's a load of nonsense. It's the difference, this idea of escape, it's the difference between, he uses kind of a military analogy, the flight of the deserter, okay, and the person wrongly imprisoned. Okay. What is a deserter? If you're in the military and you desert your post, what does that mean you do? You leave. You go AWOL, absent without leave. Okay. It means you're not willing to do what? Your job. Okay. And we're not talking about the morality of what that job is. It's just you're unwilling to do what it is you're supposed to do. Right? What about the person wrongly imprisoned? Are they supposed to accept what's happened? No. Wrongly in prison, go back to the military analogy, a prisoner of war. Used to be the case, I don't think it is anymore, World War II, it was the case. What was the first duty of an American prisoner of war? For example, captured by the Germans. Why no? Try to escape. Try to escape. Why? So you could get back to doing what it is you're supposed to be doing. Okay. So Tolkien says it's the difference between those. Fantasy literature is like the POW, trying to escape, to get back to what is ultimately really real. Okay. So escapism is not a bad thing, which leads then to recovery. And we're not going to have time to finish all of this. Yeah, we might. What's recovery? It's the regaining of a clear view or sight. He puts it in the language of seeing things as we were meant to see them. Thus implying none of us see correctly. We all have these on, whether you do physically or not. And what's the problem with that? It's like when I don't have my mask down below my nose and I've got my glasses on, what happens to them? Almost constantly. They fog up and I can't see clearly. So Tolkien says, what we need is we need to learn to see clearly. Well, what is it that we're supposed to see clearly? Everything. What's he mean by that? Well, he gives us a concrete example. He talks about families. Talks about those people, he calls them our familiars. Those people that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay? Might be your roommate, might be your boyfriend, girlfriend, family. And he says, what do we tend to do? I'll use myself as an example. I've been married for, what is it now, 36 years. Tolkien says, without recovery, what I do is I look at my wife kind of like I look at my phone. As something I possess, something I own, something that goes along with me. Okay? Why? Because we've been in that relationship for 36 plus years. And what he's getting at is what I don't see her as, or how I don't see her is as I saw her when I first met her, or even a couple of weeks after. Because I knew really soon, like within the first couple of weeks, I wanted to marry her. She was like, pack away, you know, demon. 
we went through a troubling period, let's say. Got together, broke up, got back together, because I ignore her in that, you know, magnetic time. Um, Tolkien says what we do with our familiars is we act like they're always going to be there. We put them in our pocket as something we own. We put them on a mantle as something to appreciate. What's the problem with that mentality? Imagine someone who got up on the morning of 9-11-2001 and went to work, husband or wife, who had an argument that morning with their spouse or with their child. And the last thing that other person heard was, just leave me alone. Stop trying to own me. Stop trying to control me. I hate you. And the one who's left living hears that. Echo in their mind. Knowing up here it wasn't true. It was said in the heat of the moment. But it still echoes here. That's why Tolkien says we need recovery. Why? We need to learn to see afresh, anew. We need to learn to see those people that we are closest to as what? Separate from ourselves. Not as merely my wife, my husband, my son, but as a distinct individual. And he extrapolates from that to seeing everything in that way. I know it's hard, but bear with me. Imagine walking to, and it's really hard because this building is so horrendous. Imagine walking to Peck Hall and seeing it through the eyes like a five-year-old full of wonder. I know it's pretty hard because this is what's called, it's not literally, but it works for me. Brutalist architecture came out of the communist system in the 60s, and it was called brutalist because it was designed to beat down your soul. It's the ugliest building on campus, almost, if it's not the ugliest, okay? It's supposed to be humanity's building. Humanities are supposed to lift you up, <laughs> and it kind of does just the opposite, okay? Yeah. So imagine coming here and not just seeing god-awful ugly Peck Hall, and not just seeing wall, desk, whiteboard, but seeing an individual concrete block sitting atop a mortar, sitting atop another concrete block, looking up and not just seeing the ceiling, but seeing individual tiles. And each of those tiles has a texture that if you can reach up and feel it, you can feel those little holes. And then going beyond that to looking out the window that needs to be cleaned <laughs> to facilitate recovery and seeing not just green, but Walnut Grove, which is comprised of walnut trees. And then, you know, the leaves that will turn colors in a few months. And seeing each thing as if you'd never seen before. You need an example? Get on YouTube. And you can do a search, and you can find people who've been blind all their lives. And they have a surgery and they can see. I'm probably going to tear up. There's a couple of married couples, and one of them has been blind all his or her life, has never seen the spouse. And they have surgery, and there's a camera when the bandages come off. And I think the woman, the one I'm thinking of, who sees her husband in just or people who've been deaf and they have a surgery and they can hear and they can hear their children's voices. Just that's what Tolkien is getting at. Tolkien says fairy stories can have that kind of effect. They can enable us to see as we were meant to see, 
to remove all the crap that we've acquired via living and to see everything like a five-year-old does, okay? Pretty cool if you think about it. The last point, consolation. Can't do it in two minutes, but we'll try. What's he mean by consolation? How does every Disney fairy tale end? Sleeping Beauty, Cinderella, Snow White. They get married. They get married. So it's all about, you know, male patriot. No, not about male. But it is about marriage. The happily ever after, right? That's what Tolkien means by consolation. But Tolkien doesn't mean everything's great. He does mean that there is good. Okay? That there is good, that something positive is seen. All right? And we'll talk, today is Tuesday, we'll talk Thursday about this briefly, about this idea of new catastrophe, okay? The good catastrophe is what that means. The good sudden change. It's the difference between, take out the U for catastrophe. What happened in Waverly, Tennessee on Saturday, right? No good there, except for the you know, few stories of people who survived and such. That's a catastrophe. Catastrophe doesn't literally mean bad change. It means sudden change. You know what another catastrophe would be? Would be if one of you had bought a lottery ticket and you won the Powerball. Now most of you are probably thinking, sure, but what the hell? That's not a catastrophe. That's like, thank you, God. It would be a dramatic sudden change in your life, though, wouldn't it? I don't know about you. If I played the lottery, if I bought a ticket and I won, I can't guarantee that I'd be here Thursday. <laughs> hey, you know, love you guys, love teaching, but I don't know that I can guarantee that, okay? Don't know that I can guarantee I'd be in Tennessee on Thursday, you know? <clears throat> so, that's the, the part, at least, of consolation. Okay, we'll stop there and pick up. So, for Thursday, read as much of this as you can. If you can finish it, fantastic. Get more than a few pages. Get at least halfway, okay? It's fast reading. Okay, this thing has stopped recording. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Make sure you've got all three. That one, that one. Yep, that's right.